Welcome everybody to this session at Tech Week 2020. Um, this is the introduction to Mahara and I'm Christina Hoppner and from Catalyst and we'll take you on the journey giving you a little bit of insight what Mahara is, what, what portfolios are and why we would be using them um, in order to Give, um, get you started on your own portfolio journey if you're at the beginning or give you a little bit of a refresher if you have already worked with portfolios. I will be making the recording of the session available afterwards as well as the slides um, so that you have direct access to all the links that are in the presentation. I work for Catalyst in Wellington, New Zealand and we have a bunch of offices around the country as well as Australia and um, a couple of other parts of the world. And we deal with all things open source. And that's how we also got to Mahara, um, which is an open source project that had started in 2006 here in New Zealand directly with um, tertiary institutions that required a bit more um, for their students, um, that things that the learning management system could not offer the universities and um, polytechnics. I myself had been working with Mahara since uh, 2008 when I was still in Europe and then mid-2010 I moved to Aotearoa to work with Catalyst and the Mahara development team on Mahara itself and have been the project lead for a number of years now and th through that job have the privilege of working with a number of you already and also a number of people in our wider Mahara community around the world in order to advance the software gain more insight into how portfolios are being used and uh, what we should be offering in Mahara or want to offer in Mahara in order to keep the software relevant for everybody. Mahara is being used around the world and there are certain regions um, that also have uh, Mahara user groups. So very active communities in their own regions um, not even necessarily countries, but sometimes also more localized, especially if you look at uh, the United Kingdom um, on the left side of the screen. Um, and these user groups help um, make it possible for people to come together um, in person um, or also virtually um, in order to discuss Mahara portfolio requirements within their own contexts. And then, of course, we have the much wider and bigger Mahara community um, around the entire world where everybody can ask questions. Mahara is used primarily in um, tertiary education, schools, and now increasingly also in um, organizations that re require competency tracking and also the, the showcasing of evidence. It is present on all continents of the world except Antarctica. And some user groups are very, very active. Others not so much in other and in good chunks of the world, of course, as you can see, there is no particular group that gets together, but that doesn't mean that um, they are not actively working with portfolios and um, using Mahara for that. Now, what I want to do today um, is give you a little bit of an introduction to portfolios in general, um, what I think is important for them, why we are using them, and then also show you a few examples of what people do with portfolios using Mahara. Um, since our time together is uh, limited and I do want to leave a bit of time also for questions towards the end, um, I'm only going to show you a few examples briefly, but you're very welcome to then explore them more fully on your own after the session because you'll have the links available. And then I'll also um, give you some resources that might help with your further exploration of um, the 
portfolio world and especially when you're wanting to make a plan of implementing it in your own organization um, that you have some references available and also some text that you can then uh, refer to as well as uh, consume in order to find out more about all the things that you might want to look into considering. But now what are these things called portfolios? Well, portfolios um, have been around for a very long time and they do differ quite a bit from um, the regular archives or lists of files we have on a computer or just things that we that we keep. And this definition here on folio thinking, which is based on an idea by Helen Chen uh, from Stanford University and colleagues, but here very nicely summarized by Vicky Suter on her blog, um, makes this point extremely clear, I find, um, because the portfolio is not just an archive. Um, folio thinking, the, the idea behind the portfolio work, is a process of engaging in the collection, organization, reflection, and connection that leads to a person's ability to speak intelligently and concisely, i.e. telling stories, about one's learning experiences, what they mean and their value, and how the experiences relate one to each other. Now, this is a very um, tight definition and has lots and lots of ideas in there. So let's unpack that a little bit. As the process of engaging in the collection and organization, so that is your typical archive in a way, um, and now come the really important parts for the portfolio work, I think, and those are the reflection and connection, because we are not learning on our own, and we are typically also learning from our experiences if we reflect on them, if we look back and see, well, how did that go? Could it have gone better? What did I want to do next time? And also feedback received from other people. This went really, really well. And um, I think you should uh, continue doing it. Or here are a couple of things that I think might work really good too. And all of that together is not just individual chunks of um, pieces of work, but they all together combine into a story into our learning story. And we are telling a story about our learning. That does not necessarily have to be a continuous story or one that encompasses everything. That can be multiple stories that we are telling depending on the context that we are in. And so with that storytelling and with having our learning experiences, we are making sense of them and we can also relate them to one another because nothing happens in isolation. And therefore, by being able to um, do the collection, organization, reflection and connection, we can work our learning experiences together and then also all together learn from them for other contexts. Seeing that slightly differently um, in order to Kind of use verbs that help us know what the main actions are in the folio thinking process. Um, I think they are all together these five C's, five different activities that can be very easy to remember in order to uh, in order to know what can be done with portfolios. And so the first one, which is kind of not exactly there um, in the folio thinking. A definition because that starts with the collection but at first we actually have the creation we need to create something we need to have our learning evidence um, we need to go do something in order to collect something first and then of course after the creation comes the collection um, where we just pull things together and that is your typical archive um, bring everything together but that is not a portfolio a portfolio really starts with the curation um, because with the curation um, that also encompasses the reflection, 
we actually decide, well, what of this entire collection of learning artifacts is actually important? Um, what is something that where I can showcase a particular skill? What is something where I can show the development that I have gone through um, from when I started a particular process until now? Because if we only dumped all our learning evidence out, um, then there would be too much to sift through for somebody to look at it, and they might not really see the connections. So with the curation, um, we allow people to make those connections between individual learning, art, uh, learning evidence and also see what is important in them. But again, the portfolio does not stop there. Um, the portfolio also encourages conversations and makes space for conversations. And I would say in particular, really in the um, online world, in electronic portfolios, digital portfolios, because it makes it so much easier to comment and to give feedback than if it were on paper. And therefore, these conversations are really important for our growth, for our learning, because it is through those social interactions, through the social learning, that we can often make even more sense of our learning as well as what we want to do going forward. But Mahara is not just a portfolio system um, where people can create their own learning evidence and collect it and curate it and then have conversations around it, but it also makes it possible to do that in groups. So have group portfolios, um, work together on a project and then reflect on that. And then also you'll be able to use groups for other purposes, just to um, set up a network of um, a community of practice, for example, that can also um, go beyond the boundaries of an organization. So I think with these five activities, create, collect, curate, converse, and connect, we are well on our way of having good number of activities to go through in order to build and then also maintain a portfolio. Now, sometimes people find it a little difficult to talk about the portfolio and um, what it shall do and what it does for learners. And that's where we oftentimes employ metaphors. And so one metaphor is the one of a museum or gallery. Um, this, is, this illustration here was inspired by one that uh, Mandy Mentes did at Messi University for that concept. And I'll take you briefly through it. Our very talented, uh, one of our very talented graphic designers at Catalyst, um, my colleague Yvonne, uh, made this and also the, the next illustration. Um, in order to show the two different metaphors that I wanted to um, showcase to you today. So going with the museum metaphor, you, you probably see a number of um, similarities with the language also that I had employed for the uh, five activities, because down in the basement, uh, the curator is doing the entire collection. Um, in a museum or art gallery, we don't actually have so much that creation element because that happens outside of it um, by the artists themselves. And so we are kind of starting here with the collection of um, the artifacts. And then when it comes to the time to put together an exhibit, the curator goes into the archive and selects um, artifacts that they want to showcase because they never or hardly ever put everything up into an exhibition hall, but really carefully select certain aspects, be that or certain artifacts, be that based on the period or the um, artists themselves or a group of artists. And that is where the curation comes in, where we really see that making sense that connecting the individual artifacts together to tell that story that should be told in a particular exhibition hall. And in the museum, there are also many different rooms. So it is 
in a big museum in particular, not everything is around the same topic, but there are different um, collections being displayed and also different styles. And that is also represented in Mahara really well because you don't just create one portfolio, you can create multiple portfolios. And these can be um, for many different purposes. Um, like in a museum, you can have very different collections, very different types of artifacts, and also very different themes in it. And sometimes um, certain exhibits might be paid for, and you can only enter them when you give them their credit card. And in the portfolio world, you don't really pay for access to the portfolio, um, but you might still need permission in order to access it. Um, because it is a very personal portfolio or maybe also because it is for assessment purposes. And um, therefore you don't, not everybody has access to everything. But of course you can also give feedback um, or you can participate in a tour and go through with your friends um, in order to comment on the exhibits and make sense of them for yourself. The second metaphor is a different one. In case um, museums are not really your thing, um, Hazel Owen from Ethos Consultancy here in Aotearoa came up with the portfolio as a performance metaphor. And here again, we'll take the metaphor of a building and in there we have a practice room on the left hand side where the singer and the pianist are working together on their own. Nobody else is in there. They are preparing for a performance. On the right hand side, we have the, uh, the writing team for a, a theater performance who are getting together to make final edits, um, decide on pops and on um, what the stage design should be like in a group. And then we have the performances themselves, which again can be quite different. Um, with the bottom there a theater performance with a lot of people in it, and then at the top more of a rock concert where they have um, is where there's another group of people. And you as portfolio author, if you're going with this metaphor, again, can decide who shall have access to a particular portfolio. And that can be one person, that can be a small group of people, or that can be the entire world. And um, you can differentiate between your portfolios. There are many other um, metaphors possible for portfolio work and if you have your own uh, that you're working with because um, they, these metaphors did not just come about for electronic portfolio work then please do feel free to put them into the chat. But now let's take a look at a portfolio very quickly to see how especially that um, reflective element can come out. Um, I've pulled out the important bits and pieces so that you can see them more easily. And um, after the session, you will have access to uh, the portfolio itself so that you can read through everything if you like. So this is a portfolio by Teresa McKinnon um, from the University of Warwick. Um, she created a portfolio for CMALT. Uh, the certified member of the Association of Learning Technologists, um, where she was required to write a portfolio in order to become that certified member, or in her case, actually, to be to stay certified. And so there were a number of questions that she needed to answer, and her portfolio, I find, um, really showcases very well how you can weave that element of the reflection and curation of all your learning evidence into a portfolio without really writing a lot of text. And so key points for her here are um, where it shows that she's reflected on her learning. Um, these four elements that I pulled out, um, the first one being the point at which I realized. So she's not looking at everything or pointing out everything, but really just a very crucial element. She revisited each of the sections of her original CMOD submission 
um, she looked back at what she had done in the past. And she also got um, advice and uh, feedback from other people. So she connected and had conversations with others um, because she says feedback and mentoring was very helpful. So she's incorporated that feedback and um, the advice she had received into her learning. And then last but not least, um, it was also a highlight that she wants to make stand out more than anything else in order to demonstrate her particular skill or competency in an area. And by using these such elements and reflecting on the learning and only really putting things in front of an evaluator or an assessor um, that showcases in this case her abilities to the best, um, is it possible for her to, to really hone in on her skills and demonstrate them rather than um, just putting a truckload of learning evidence there and then asking an assessor to make sense because mostly they will probably not be able to do that since they don't necessarily have the context and so with the narrative and that can be a narrative also in audio or video she is helping the assessor to look at her portfolio and really um, see what she wants them to see um, namely that is her learning story um, her learning journey But how do we get there? Well, oftentimes it's not on our own, unfortunately, um, because portfolios do require rethinking of how learning and in particular also teaching is done, what is expected, because there's definitely more onus on the learners themselves um, in reflecting things because they need to look at themselves rather than just repeat something that they had heard. And like any other change that is to be made, making change in an educational context, be that formal education or workplace education, does require support. And th I find that support is really crucial in order to have a very good portfolio program. And here's a quote from um, Brett Einen and Laura Gambino, um, they are portfolio researchers in New York where they say the process of curating the connected collection making meaning through reflection and thereby developing deeper more intentional identities as learners requires thoughtful student action guided by well-informed faculty and staff and supported by a broad coalition of college stakeholders and while they had been writing this for higher education, um, I think this really applies in every context because unless we have the support and also the mandate to implement portfolios and implement them well and support people who are creating portfolios, will it at some point not really work out well? Um, because portfolios oftentimes do require scaffolding um, in order to get people started because reflecting and giving feedback um, does not really come necessarily easily um, because people haven't always learned it in school or at uni. And therefore that support is incredibly important. And when portfolio programs have that support, you do see how people can thrive in them and that it is not the portfolio and then everything else, but that the portfolio is really part of the rest of the learning experience. That it's not the separate thing, but it connects to all the learning and has elements everywhere so that it just becomes part of the process rather than, oh, now I have to do my portfolio. And the programs that do have that support work very well um, because then management is oftentimes also really behind it and um, makes time available for the staff members to seek training um, or to come together on a regular basis in order to discuss portfolio matters um, rather than just seeing it as a technology tool 
If it is only managed by IT without any pedagogical support, um, then oftentimes um, it does require, oftentimes it requires really this enthusiasm by one lecturer or by one person, but then when responsibilities um, are shifted or so, it can be very quick that it's then not supported as well anymore. Therefore, hopefully, you'll be able to have that support at your organization to not just start a portfolio program, but also sustain it over time. So what can portfolios look like? Once you've made the start, um, you do have the support, you know where you want to go. Um, what can we do? This is just a very small selection of portfolios and um, via this link here, you can take a look at many more um, or search for portfolios on your own or let me know if you're looking for something particular and I might be able to point you either to an example that I have access to or to point you to an organization that creates portfolios like the ones you're envisaging so that you can get in touch with them yourself. This one here um, is from the University of the Arts London. Um, its Mahara site is called Workflow. And that is a relatively typical student portfolio, um, in this case with lots of pictures because it is an art school. And then also the reflection right on the site. And um, there are a several number of pages in this portfolio because the, the student is um, using that for a research project. The second portfolio looks very different, not as colorful, yet still incredibly rich. And um, what Vaita Mata has done here, Vaita Mata DHB, um, is create a portfolio for its nurses um, that need to go through the registered nurse certification. And these portfolios, because they are part of nursing, where it is oftentimes not yet so easy to take photos because it's typically of patients, um, is very text heavy. Um, but it is extremely effective and efficient for the nurses. And Vitamata DHB really showcases also how um, portfolios can be used extremely well and how a portfolio um, portfolio uh, program can thrive when there is the support available because these portfolios are templates. Um, they were created by the learning design team and all the nurses need to do is put in their self-assessment for the individual competencies. Then they make it available to their peer assessors who then comment themselves how the nurse has completed competencies and then the manager gets access and then the um, PDRP assessor also gets access via the learning management system. And so because it is based on a competency framework, typically then a nurse might need to write all of that down herself and what the indicators are or um, if it's done in the learning management system, look up the competencies. Whereas here on Mahara, all of that can be provided immediately to the nurses. Um, because templates can be created, there can be instructions on the template uh, themselves so that the nurses know what they actually need to do. And that makes the creation of the portfolios incredibly easy compared to previous terms when everything needed to be done manually and then also by printing things out uh, when it was a paper portfolio. And nurses as well as managers and um, nurse educators have commented on this being a very efficient system for the nurses and making it also easy not just to compile the portfolio, but also to assess the portfolio and review it. This is an example from another university, Future Generations University in the States, um, where the student wrote a reflection at the end of her study program and um, in this case reflected on the portfolio work in general by writing a little poem about it um, in which you can see how people can sometimes struggle with portfolio work, um, especially in the beginning because it is very different from how they are typically working. And then though, with the help of um, 
her faculty members and by using the portfolio on a regular basis, kind of really getting to a very good result. But Mahara can't just be used for personal portfolios as I've explained earlier, but you can actually also um, add instructional elements or even course material to it if you don't want to use um, the uh, LMS, as is exhibited here by a colleague of mine from our European office, um, who put together a number of small activities um, to bring the designing of ePortfolio activities closer to educators. And so she includes a um, presentation and then has a number of activities on this page that you are very welcome to check out and see if you find something that you might want to put into your toolbox yourself. So kind of coming to a few of the advantages of using an electronic um, platform and in our case, of course, in particular, Mahara for the portfolio work, I'd like to um, briefly go through those advantages with you. In general, Mahara is very learner centric. Um, in contrast to a learning management system, um, our learners decide on their own what they want to do, where they want to keep it, for how long they want to keep the learning evidence and how they want to display it. Of course, if it's for assessment purposes, then they still need to follow certain guidelines. But in general, teachers don't have immediate access to portfolios, but they need to be invited by learners. Mahara is very versatile. It can be used for a multitude of portfolio types, um, including showcase portfolios, uh, developmental portfolios, progress portfolios, presentation portfolios, employability portfolios, and also assessment portfolios. Um, with that versatility, of course, comes also a huge number of features, um, which at times can be overwhelming. And that is where the scaffolding can come in really, really importantly uh, to guide learners through what they need um, in the first instance until they are more comfortable with um, the new platform that they are using. Mahada is also social because we can have groups and people can interact with each other, give each other feedback um, and also work together. And it can work with multimedia. Nobody says that a portfolio has to be text. Um, you can also upload audio or video files and of course also in particular images. It is also supportive. And with that, I mean that um, you're never really on a completely empty page, um, on a completely blank page on the screen. But there's always um, small instructions or guidance available to tell you what you can do on a screen um, in the platform in order to help you complete the tasks. It is also accessible and can also be connected to a learning management system in order to do that if you have a great book that you want to keep just in one place. Mahara is also mobile. Um, you don't even need an app for that um, because it can be viewed on mobile screens um, just through the browser. But we do have a mobile app available that makes it possible to collect learning evidence while being offline and then uploading into the portfolio once you're online again. It is secure um, because everybody wanting to, who wants to create a portfolio needs a login and um, others don't automatically have access to that portfolio. Um, but at the same time, you can also make your portfolio once you're ready for it um, available to people outside of your organization or inner circle and even shared with the entire world. But we have general basic um, security measures in place in order to keep also account information secure. Mahara is accessible. Um, currently, we are also investigating the WCAG 2.1 um, guidelines in order to continue to stay accessible and make the platform um, and keep it so that the platform is um, or can be used by everybody, even when they are working with screen readers or a keyboard. 
It can be integrated with learning management systems and in particular also single sign-on systems um, in order to become part of the overall um, digital learning environment that is available at an organization. And it is customizable. Mahara is an open source product and therefore you can change every and every aspect of it if you like. Um, we do have some ways of making changes in an easier way and that is in particular in regards to the theme as well as the language adjustments but in theory everything can be changed and can also be customized to your specific requirements and Mahara is also portable or rather the portfolios are portable because that is also a very important aspect for us um, as part of the open source um, world that your data is not locked into a particular platform, but that you can take it with you. And so students have up to three export formats available um, that they can use. And one of those even makes it possible to import their portfolio into another Mahara site. Now, because there's so much functionality in Mahara, we do have a manual available where all of those are um, outlined and explained um, in order to lock things up and use it like a reference menu. And the community has also created a number of videos that can be referenced and um, a number of organizations also make their own little guides to focus on little or bigger guides um, to focus on the functionalities that they want um, their audiences to use. Now, kind of coming back to a bit more generic portfolio work, if you say, well, that is really interesting, I'd like to learn more and I just need to have some more arguments um, and how we can implement portfolios, here are some resources. The Field Guide to ePortfolio. <coughs> Sorry, the Learning Portfolio in Higher Education, a Game of Snakes and Letters, and also ePortfolio Based Assessment. These are all three fantastic resources created by portfolio community members, so not necessarily Mahara ones, because these are more general resources, and um, give you an idea of what you might want to look at when you start working with portfolios and then of course also based on your interests for example if you want to have a learning portfolio um, or if you want to focus on um, assessment tasks they are all giving very good but also very short insight into the topics um, so that uh, you can go through them quickly and also send them off to your manager if you like so that they can um, read through them and also help you make decisions. Now, if you have any questions, um, please do feel free to get in touch with me via email um, or we can look at your questions right now because we still have about a, uh, 15 minutes left in our session for you to ask questions. <coughs> 